Okay, I'm going to try drum roll, see if it works. It needs to upload first. Wow, that, that was the second time. <laughs> like a car roll. How are you doing, yeah. man? Man, you're catching uh, me on a funny day. Like, I took up swimming and I think I caught like some eye infection in the pool. So now I look like uh, yeah. 20 years older than I am. Uh, okay. That's what they all say in terms of like where they caught pink eye. It's usually got to do with yeah. um, bowel movements in the bed. So, <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> I don't think it's work. pink eye. Yeah, no, yeah it's not pink eye. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> Okay, so no. um, I don't usually introduce my guests um, because I often know quite a bit about them. I'd like them to just maybe give a bit of um, an intro of themselves, and that's how we get into the discussion about um, business, I think. So, yeah, who, who is Carl van Weyck? Well, uh, I'm a South African citizen, and but also a netizen, a citizen of the internet. I guess I grew mm. up on the net as like a uh, introverted file that just um, locked himself in his room and spent a lot of time talking on like internet forums and, you know, IRC, the golden days of the internet before we got uh, okay. TikTok and all this nonsense that we have today. So <laughs> um, I guess I'm just a huge nerd. Uh, I'm a qualified electronic engineer, but I've spent very little time working on electronics and most of my time working on software and mm. in particular, the type of software that connects sort of, uh, systems, software systems to real world applications. So there's nothing, mm. nothing better for me. Like when I can build something where you can use a software tool and affect for change in the physical world, like that's, mm. that's my passion. So then mm -hmm. naturally that leads it to, um, things like uh you know payment systems and stuff like that where you can actually apply mm -hmm. software and you can you can have a real world service or good that you get from that yeah and that's basically me in a nutshell it's like total uh internet nerd yeah. <laughs> why do you think why do you think it often the application of technology for instance actually ends up in something like financial technology and and um, payment systems and things like that. And why, if, if it's, if that's not the case, um, why did you end up in that, in that space? Mm, that's quite a, a wide question, but fundamentally, if you, if you think about money, money mm. is a, I mean, we're talking about what business bucks and beach bands, right? So yeah. talking about bucks, money itself is a form of technology. Mm. It's tech that's been developing for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Mm. And um, it's just natural that we apply sort of modern digital technology to facilitate the need to, um, mm. you know, interact exchange. with each other in a, okay. in a commercial way. Yeah. To exchange mm. services, goods, but also to mm. store the, the fruits of our labor in a mm. form of, you know, store of value. Savings so and I think investments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of that stuff. So I think it's it's natural. And then mm -hmm. we live in sort of a very interesting era now where, you know, it's almost like we used to use tech to solve the money problem. But now it's almost like uh, it's flipped around. Like we've, we've encoded this idea that, you know, you, in the past money used to be something scarce, like, um, mm -hmm. I mean, gold or even mm -hmm. shells and stuff like that. But now mm. it's just your bank balance is like an entry in the database, right? Mm. So the question we have today is like, what is, what is money if it's, if it's no longer backed by anything that's scarce or mm. solid? Mm. It's just taken yeah. yeah. It's all just numbers on a computer screen. How much of it is real? <laughs> How much of it's real? Um, I don't think it was ever real. Yeah. I, I mean, think I think whatever we story. created. Whatever we created, we created ourselves, right? In some way. And we, we need to recreate ourselves. it. Mm. It's all just this, this, what they call like a shade myth. Mm. You might call it a shade delusion, but it's a shade dream that we all have. These numbers don't have any meaning unless we all believe that they do. 
Mm-hmm. So tell me a bit about, I mean, uh, the business part of, of the podcast in terms of, you know, what have you done um, in terms of your jobs, um, your businesses that you, you've been involved in um, or started and, and, and how that transition was um, in some sort of general detail where you come from. So your, your career path in some respects um, and, and how you see that having progressed and where you are now. Yeah, I think uh, I've always sort of felt that um, I want to try new things and that lends itself to entrepreneurship. So uh, mm. like in high school, I had a couple of sort of projects building computers and selling computers for people. And then after university, I decided instead of going to work for somebody, let's try to build mobile games. That was a big mm. mistake. That didn't work out. Um, okay. Then I joined a startup called Snapscan. At that point, okay. uh, it, I mean, it didn't exist from, from, I was basically the, one of the first engineers to join. Um, that worked out. Okay. That worked out well. I mean, everybody knows Snapscan today. Mm. Um, South Africa. The, I forgot the, yeah. I forgot the other day that it's not an international product. And I was asking someone about <laughs> Snapscan. Um, and I forgot that it's a very South African based, um, technology. Yeah. If it wasn't for Standard Bank, I don't know whether it would be known as as widely in South Africa, but then beyond South Africa, it's, it's not known, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and as part of that sort of deal, I had the opportunity to start a new, uh, a new project um, to do a little proof of concept for the bank on Bitcoin. And it was still quite new, 20, we're talking about 2013. Um, yeah. And we were able to develop a fully fledged Bitcoin wallet. You can buy, sell, send, store, all of that stuff, all the basic functionality. And you could log in with your standard bank online banking profile and you could access all these, uh, this functionality. Um, but that was just an internal proof of concept. It was never going to go to market. So as part of the project, um, uh, we built up a team. And the team asked itself, are we going to be building proof of concept for banks forever, or are we going to do something else? And mm. the team decided, well, let's, uh, let's just build a fully fledged product, um, on its own merit mm. it's with its own brand as a, as a B2C business. Mm. And that became Bitex. And Bitex okay. eventually rebranded into Luno. Mm. Right. Okay. B2C being, um, business to client or customer so to the to business the retail to customer public. yeah that means essentially who, who, who's the person that uh, that you interact with on a daily basis is it the, mm. is it general public or is it another business is it is mm. it an individual um, person or is it the, like a company so b2b mm. would be business to business b2c is business to consumer mm. consumer yeah customer or client depending on what business yeah. you're in some people prefer to use different terms Client, I think, is your upper echelon usually of um, person. Customers more wide, and consumer is very wide, very retail. And um, and and what are you doing now? Um, because you're no longer at Luna, right? Yeah, I left Luna in 2019, um, and I'm doing again. I like to do sort of things that's a bit more on the on the on the cutting edge or a bit more experimental. Hmm. So when we started with Luna, I mean, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin and, and that stuff was very experimental and cutting edge. I think this, these days is a lot more mainstream. We've got ETFs uh, in the US hmm. and we've got um, countries asking for foreign aid in, in Bitcoin. So hmm. it's, it's a lot more sort of um, widespread now. But the question now hmm. is, can we use this thing as a form of money? Because in the past, I think the answer was mm, not really. It was difficult to to really move it around. I mean, mm. I mean you can you can disagree with me on that, but but in in reality, what we see is at mm. times it becomes expensive to move. Um, mm. It can be quite tricky to keep safe and all that stuff. So what I'm working on now yeah. is a Bitcoin payments project to see okay. if we can use it as money. Okay. 
We'll talk a little bit about that more, but let's just go back a little bit to the, I think that's why it was called a bit of a digital gold, if I can put it that way, because it was a good store of value, quite safe. But I mean, gold is not something that you easily trade with these days. It used to be, um, but then it turned into, you know, some other form of, of, of exchange that was easier to, to use. And nowadays it's, you know, easy to move digital money around by credit cards and EFTs and all kinds of interesting electronic ways. Um, and I mean, I think South Africa has always been quite, quite ahead of that in terms of, you know, payment systems, I think from what I, I'm not so familiar with the payment system, but have gotten involved in that. And, and I think that's why it got seen, Bitcoin got seen as more of a investment product, but I mean, its intention exactly. was to be, it's, an, it, it, it's intention was to be uh, an exchange, you know, from a peer to peer method of, of, of exchange. And, um, and I think when we discussed this some time back with the payment stuff, you were interested in making sure that it becomes that as well, so that it doesn't only get seen as investment because for my industry and, and background where I'd come from, um, I, it, it was interesting that because, because of using investments generally as a way of, of, of helping people grow wealth, um, this focus was on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies um, to, you know, to be this investment product. And that's where things like scams become rife, uh, Ponzi schemes and all of that is because now people are trying to, you know, uh, make money, but it's one of its major intended purposes was to actually use it as money on a daily basis. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you've managed to, to, to do that so far. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. So if you, if you look at the white paper, the original Bitcoin paper, or let's call it academic paper that was published even before the system was launched before the code, mm. the title was Bitcoin, a peer to peer electronic cash system. Mm. Cash Sorry. is a very beautiful definition of cash in the Merriam Webster dictionary. Um, it says cash is ready money. Right. To me, that's beautiful because it means it's money that's ready. It's ready to apply. Ready, right? yeah. yeah. You've taken your gold, yeah. exchange it for something, uh, something ready that you can, that you can still have exactly. your store of value, but you can use it on a daily basis because you've got daily expenses that we need to be paying. Yeah, that's that's the opposite of an investment. An investment is something that you 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 put money towards a goal. Uh, in the future. Mm. So, so typically mm. it's not ready. So if you think in terms of, let's say a fixed deposit, you know, 32 day call account, um, uh, an annuity or whatever, these things typically they come with very long, um, uh, terms. It's quite long to get your money out. So it's not very liquid, mm. right? it's not cash, it's not ready. Mm. And then, then compare that to cash that you have in a wallet well, these days, nobody carry physical cash anymore, but, mm. um, with a card, you can just spend straight away. And then, uh, mm. it's a very different use case. And the question is, can we bridge these two use cases in the crypto land, in crypto space, Bitcoin, mm. Bitcoin land specifically. Mm. Um, and yeah, when, when we started Luno, I expected people will use this money naively because I, as a person growing up on the internet, I thought this could be the native currency of the internet. It will be something mm. that will be used for internet commerce. And it turned out the opposite is true. 99.9% .9 of people only engage with it as an investment, only as uh, something that they expect will increase in value. So they speculate and they mm. never, ever use it to buy stuff, even today. So we, we've built this amazing system that lets you spend Bitcoin directly at the point of sale at the retailer in like at a physical brick and mortar store. It works phenomenally mm. well. It's faster than, it's faster than even card. It's faster than anything else. It's cheaper mm. than anything else. Mm. It's global, borderless. I can go on and on about the merits. And, and the number mm. one thing that people tell me when I, when I talk about it is they say, well, I'll never spend my Bitcoin. <laughs> mm. I'll never use this system, this magical system. And when I ask them mm. why not, they say, well, because I'd rather spend my rands because it's not going to go up in value. I keep the Bitcoin mm. because I think it'll go up in value. And mm. so it's almost like, after years and years and years of building software, 
and developing products and you know refining user inter interfaces ux we reach a point where everything in a, on a technical level is nearly perfect yeah but philosophically <laughs> philosophically yeah. people don't mm. engage with it because they they'd rather have more bitcoin not less mm. But it's, it, I mean, for me personally, I mean, um, uh, give me your, your view on this, but I'm going to talk, talk from a personal experience point of view. I get that. Um, but there's, an, there's, an, there's a flip side of the coin to that um, in that the system that you guys built, you know, you use it at, at pick and pay. Uh, it's one of the only retail, large retailers that is that has put it in place. Um, and, you know, I put some money into it wanting to okay i'm going to shop with this money at some point and i did a bit of shopping and i was it was to test the system a little bit get to get to understand it um see how easy it actually is even though i know that you know from a development and, and user experience point of view there was you know you've got to use your app and then a, a, a lightning wallet and you can maybe explain that a little bit more um mm -hmm. i'm no expert in that um but just from a personal p perspective like yeah, sure. I did use some of my 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 money that I had and and credit that I had, you know, to to purchase things. But at some point, I opened my my Lightning wallet and realized that, geez, and I suddenly had, you know, some a little bit more money. Um, sure, it's 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 not it's 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 not a you got to be aware of the fact that it could also be a little bit less at some point and manage that process. But there was a month in in particular where I was short. On, on some of my budget and I was it was it was lucky enough that I'd actually had um, that Bitcoin had, had had gone up a little bit and at that stage quite a, quite a lot and I actually had new money that I could spend at pick and pay and it helped me immensely that month and I could just go buy my stuff at pick and pay so there's a flip side to that as well um, and mm. Yes, it's all about managing that for yourself. Um, but definitely, mm -hmm. it, 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 I literally had new money that I created for myself. I mean, isn't that part of the point? Yeah, absolutely. So that flip side is kind of the growth that we're seeing. There is a flip mm -hmm. side, like you say. So it's not the, mm -hmm. I guess, not the mainstream. But there's, there are mm -hmm. these use cases, like you just said, you know what? You um, were a bit short in the month and you had to mm -hmm. spend some of your savings or your investments, right? Mm. And now mm. what were your options? Well, if you had stocks first, you'd have to go and liquidate that stuff on a platform somewhere and then wait five days. Easy equities, it takes you five days to withdraw mm. the money that uh, that you've liquidated. Um, yep. Similarly with, if, like if it was in the pension, it's stuck. Yeah. Mm. So what you had there is you had this investment, um, but it was immediately available. So it was ready money mm. at that point in time. Mm. And you could, you could apply it. So that is a use case. And that, that's where we see um, some numbers come through. And then interestingly, there's people that's earning Bitcoin. You know, they earn a salary mm -hmm. in Bitcoin or they receive mm -hmm. donations in Bitcoin or whatever. So they've got income in Bitcoin. And then the options are either they can liquidate it first and, and apply rands or they can apply directly. So we are seeing growth. That's great. We're seeing mm -hmm. strong growth, but it's not mainstream growth. It's organic growth of these sort of, let's call it flip side use cases. Right. Yeah. Do you think, do you think that this might balance out a little bit once all Bitcoin are mined and, and, and the, this use case that you talk about is more mainstream, then it's, then it, in any event, I think part of it is sure there might be an increase or, you know, I, I, I'm not an investment expert. I'm a personal finance person more than anything else. And someone that understands the regulatory space, from a legal perspective, but um, you know, at some point, this is going to even out a little bit, and you're not going to see such massive increases in the value of Bitcoin. And is that a time when this could be a little bit more mainstream um, as well, where you see a, a, a sort of a more equalization of the of the price of Bitcoin at some point when it matures? It, th yeah, that's quite a tricky thing, and. A lot of people mm. ask me about this because obviously everybody's asking me, you know, when should I buy Bitcoin and when should I sell Bitcoin? Mm. Um, that's the number one question I get when I go and speak at a conference afterwards. People are like, okay, but, but now wait, do you think it's a good time to buy now? Do you think it's a good time to sell? Mm. So what I tell them, uh, when is the best time to plant a tree? Mm. Right? 
It says mm. today, if you didn't plant it yesterday, you plant it today. So if you didn't Do buy some yesterday, buy some today. Mm. Um, but as for sort of the, the, the outlook on the price and stability of, let's talk about volatility, I think mm. that we still haven't seen anything yet. We, the, 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 at the end of the day, the price is determined by the global market. Mm. And there's going to be massive, massive things happening in the global market over the next couple of decades. I mean, just mm. separately from Bitcoin, separately from crypto, there's a ton of uncertainty about the future of like the world reserve currency, the US dollar. Um, mm. There's what is perceived as massive shifts in power globally. Mm. So just, just sort of in terms of global markets, I expect there'll be a lot of volatility anyway. And then you bring Bitcoin into mm. the mix and you mm. have this kind of asset that I expect, I fully expect nation states will start adopting it more and more as a reserve. Um, and even if they're not announcing it, they'll be doing so in secret. Um, I'm flabbergasted mm. by Germany selling like, what is it like 50,000 Bitcoin? Because they'll, yeah, they they'll be wrong. buying those Bitcoin back. They'll be buying those Bitcoin back in the next 10 to 20 years at a vastly higher price. And they'll be kicking themselves mm. that they've sold it. So mm. I expect nation states will start adopting digital scarce assets like Bitcoin mm. uh, as a reserve asset over the next couple of decades. And that's going to have massive mm. impact as well. Then you mm. can imagine sort of when there's wars being fought, um, and you've got Bitcoin on one or either side of that. It's, we're just, we haven't seen anything yet. So I, I don't even want to speculate too much about the price stabilizing in any point soon. It will go through sure. periods of stability, but we'll mm. go through periods of massive volatility as well. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be interesting how that starts panning out in because I mean, I, it's 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 not something to talk about in in this podcast necessarily. But you, I mean, I do think there's a place for stable coins as well in terms of how that impacts the the, the forex markets and 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 Bitcoin might be its own currency in that play against still um, a traditional uh, um, uh, currencies, but in digital format. So I think I think there's going to be an, a very interesting play between. And I wonder where Bitcoin is going to feature in that. Like it basically it's, you know, it could be it's, and maybe that's what it was intended to do is, is, is be a, a separate currency that is, that is traded, um, like in world markets, but digitally between stable coins that are representing, uh, existing fiat markets, you know, um, something along those lines. Yeah. It's not yeah, something I want to talk Bitcoin. about too much yeah. because I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily understand it, but I, but, but I think that's where it could eventually fit in. It's, it's, it, it will be an, an, an additional currency that you, is, is slotted in between uh, a digital representation. Eventually, I would say, of like in the form of stable coins, you know, in, in world, in world foreign exchange markets, you know, and that'll be quite interesting. But I think I would say that mm -hmm. it stables out to some degree, because you do have differences in, in, in those markets and they could be vast as well. So it depends where Bitcoin fits in there. And, and I think that's maybe a potential, potential future. Um, yeah, but uh, maybe one last point on that. If you, yeah. if you, if we are talking about the future, then, but what, what Bitcoin offers some people, so everybody doesn't have to agree, but it offers some certainty in a world that's extremely uncertain. That certainty mm. is that there's a maximum issuance. There's a maximum limit. There's a defined inflation rate. Mm. There's, a, there's, there's a cap in the total amount that can ever exist. And, mm. and you can, the, the, the level of certainty that you can have in that is higher right. than you can have in almost anything else. Yeah. And yeah. yes, it's a, it's an uncertain and scary thing to a lot of people, but it hasn't failed it in 11 years. Okay. No, 11. 12, 13, 20 years, it's not a long time, but mm. in all of that time, it hasn't failed yet. And my personal belief is that it won't fail. And the longer it doesn't fail, the more people 
will look at it as a hedge against uncertainty. Yeah. I expect that adoption will only keep going up and up and up as the world becomes more and more uncertain. If we lived in a mm. utopic utopia, there'd be no need for Bitcoin, I think. Mm. Bitcoin is a is this thing that you when you when you start feeling worried about the world and you you you, you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. You look at things like gold. Gold's been certain for millennia, mm. and I think increasingly people will start looking at things that's digitally scarce and certain in the in the digital world as well. Mm. Mm. But also it'll have a cycle. It, it cycles because uh, you know I, I think we're going through a certain cycle that if you look at uh, a guy like Ray Dalio um, um, who wrote Principles and has one of the um, biggest most successful hedge funds in the world that's not really even available retail but to um, large very large institution and even and even um, governmental organizations running their pension fund money and um, also very knowledgeable from a commodities perspective um, and that's but he's very much about looking at history and the and the reason for that is that because a lot of things repeat themselves yes sure you'll have nuances because of new things like technology and i think that's why we're in an interesting cycle right now because we're going through a similar cycle that maybe was around about 100 years ago going towards the big depression maybe and things like that you know i don't i don't know the timelines and i'm not an expert in that but we're going through a current cycle and what we have in this cycle is something like digital gold and digital um, representations of money that 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 are a different nuance, but we can follow things like gold and other things from a previous cycle and how they did. And and I think I thought about this the other day. I mean, in many ways, and I know we your business now is payments, and 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 we want to look at something like a peer-to-peer -peer exchange but i think that in many ways if you think about um holding gold and holding your private keys for your bitcoin um is very similar to that it's a very similar thing and that's why there would be an increase in 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 my opinion just from my understanding and there's many other things that would play a part that i don't understand but that would it, it, there's a very big similarity between if you look at a cycle and you look at what gold did in that cycle, you can probably have some idea of what Bitcoin's going to do, provided you're keeping it in your private keys locked up and all of that um, necessity that needs to be done from a digital perspective. If you know what you're doing, if you don't know if what you're, you're doing, you'll probably lose your Bitcoin. Yeah, and I think that's what people are afraid of, isn't it? There's I mean, a lot of ways. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to lose it. Mm. Yeah. So that's, it's, I think, some uh, understanding that needs to be put out there in education. That education, needs to be, be yeah, done. for sure. Mm. A continuous effort in education, and you kind of have to keep abreast of um, latest developments all the time. So the, the, the ecosystem is very different today than it was when Bitcoin was launched. When it launched, there were no network fees, um, uh, I mean, mm. the 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 price was so much lower, so you could um, you could get it much more easily. There were literally websites where you could just enter your Bitcoin wallet address, and it would send you free Bitcoin. You just click mm. on that, and you get free Bitcoin mm. on a the website. They call it, call them faucets. Mm. Mm -hmm. Today it's very really different. Uh, so to give you an example, I spoke to a guy. He said he's buying some Bitcoin every month. Um, and he's, he, he's what they call dollar cost averaging, and he'll keep dollar cost averaging for the next 20 years, and then he's going to retire. That's mm. his plan. Mm. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. Um, so these transactions that you're sending to your, you're sending it to your own wallet. Yes, he's sending it to his own wallet. He's keeping it safe himself. Okay, that's great. Um, these transactions, are you consolidating them at any point? He said, no, what are you talking about? I said, look, the the price or the cost to move money on the Bitcoin network, as the price goes up, the cost to move money on the network goes up as well. So mm. if you, let's say you you put a thousand rand into your wallet today, and a couple of years from now, the the network costs have increased significantly. It might cost you five hundred rand to move that thousand rand, 
Now you've done it on a monthly basis. So you've got 12, 1,000 rand transactions that you need to move out. And it's going to cost you half of the amount that you put right. in just to move it again. So, okay. so what you should be doing is you should be consolidating those on a regular basis so that it's one transaction that if you need to move it at some point, it's just one transaction. Yeah. How does one do you that? Have to like, you'll create a new address and you'll just send everything from these, let's say over a year's time, from All these right. sort of 12 receipts yes. that you got. Okay. Because Bitcoin doesn't work like a lot of people think it works like a, a, ba a bank balance where, you know, mm. if I add 10 Rand, my balance goes up by 10 Rand. If I add 20 Rand, goes up by 20 It doesn't work like that. It's more like, um, it's it's a lot more, like if I have to come up with a quick metaphor, it's a, it's a bit more like cash in the sense mm. that you put notes into a wallet, right? The, mm. the balance of your wallet is the sum of the notes. It's not an amount that's changing like like on your bank. It's the sum of the notes that they put into it. Mm. And so if you have to like spend a note or if you want to spend money, you take notes out of the wallet. Now with Bitcoin, mm. that action of moving one of those price. notes has a price associated, a cost associated with it. Right, interesting. Yeah, a lot of technicalities. But I think something that's, that ultimately, I don't think people, my view is that people should be more inquisitive about it and ask more questions because um, it's, it's not necessarily as complicated as one would like to think. But it's also something you need to learn about. So it's not necessarily just a simple either. Um, and what do you think about, you know, in terms of people getting sort of started around this? Because I think, you know, your retail sort of exchanges, um, you know, talking about Luna, Bitex that, that you were involved in, in founding, um, it's, it's a good learning, learning curve, right? I mean, it, it is a good way to start. Um, would, would you say, or are there easier ways to start? You know, how would you suggest someone just starting uh, from one day to the next? What, mm. what do you think they should do? It's certainly the, the safest way. way. Mm. It's the safest way because the, and the easiest because they have experts that look at all mm. these problems, security issues yeah. and consolidation issues and network issues. Mm. They've got teams of people that's dedicated to solving it and staying up to date. So mm. it's, it's certainly the safest. And then obviously they can put money into making it easy and simple as well. Mm. So it's the best, probably the best way if you don't, if you don't have mm. much education, then to go via um, a Luna or a Valor or a Binance, for example. Yeah. Um, and then, then to start educating yourself, then like you, we spoke, you, you mentioned scams and stuff earlier. There's so many scams, people that just promise you, Hey, you know, send me Bitcoin and or double your money, whatever, mm, mm. Or, or variations on that. So many people fall for that. And mm. I've got people, I get emails from retired pensioners mm. and they tell me we've lost uh, a big chunk of our pension to a Bitcoin scam. And then when I ask them about it, it's, it's almost it's, every time it's the same thing. There's some promise of, high returns it's some crypto thing they've heard about crypto and people making money in crypto and they thought you know mm. we can try it as well and they put in a little bit then the the value goes up they withdraw it and then they're like oh well it's completely legitimate because we can put in we can withdraw and that's how they catch you then you put in a lot and then you never see your money mm. again mm. and the question is how do you protect against that now now companies like luno sorry last point that companies like luno they send out regular communications they regularly warn you of scams. They've got a uh, big knowledge bases, so you can go and um, go and read their help articles and read about scams, get educated there. And mm. then when you make, when you send transactions out, this is maybe where it starts to get a bit frustrating for people that want to advance a bit more into sort of, uh, you know, self custody and stuff like that. Mm. When you try to send Bitcoin and other crypto out of a comp uh, like a wallet like Luna Valor. They actually make it quite hard. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because they know so many people get scammed. So they, they, they'll say, listen, are you sure you want to do this transaction? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you are sure, we're going to send an SMS. There'll be a link that you need to use to verify. So there's, there's all these steps and they'll also be monitoring the address that mm -hmm. they're sending to. So if they pick up that you're sending to a known scam wallet address, they're going to warn you about that as well. 
Mm. That's great if you need all those guardrails. It's like the, yeah. um, uh, you know, the, the, the little wheels on a, on a bike when you just start riding. But mm. um, it got, does get frustrating when you feel like, okay, I've gone through all of the effort to educate myself and I, I think I've got a better understanding of how, how all of this works and I don't want all of that friction. Mm. Um, you know, then you start looking into self-custody and mm. all of that stuff. Yeah, I think there's a there's a middle way as well because I think, and I see it from the evolution of this um, this sort of thing called Bitcoin and, and, and even some other cryptocurrencies and whatever their use case is um, and blockchains. But not to go into too deep with that, is, is the evolution of, of, of someone making personal savings um, and, and saving for themselves. You know, at the end of the day, you can you can go to, on easy equities and pick a couple of stocks. But, you know, I think people have also burned themselves in that. They hear, okay, here's a little bit of a, um, uh, a tip on, on this share and maybe I should buy some Capitec or big banks or maybe I should buy some um, uh, retail shares or some, some resource shares or whatever. But they don't quite understand it, you know, so they go to an asset manager that is putting all of these things together, hoping to get a good return. Um, or um, nowadays ETFs are, are quite quite um, uh, sort of the run of the well, more popular because you're buying the market. You know, you don't necessarily need an asset manager that's picking the best stocks and trying to get a return for you. You might as well just buy the top 15 stocks on the stock exchange that are listed. You know, so those are evolutions of, mm. of, of, of approach in finance. And then eventually someone will go, okay, you know what? I think I'm going to create an easy equity. And easy equities is probably still more like a Luna in that, you know, there's a lot of things that they have to do in the back end to make sure that they're buying your shares. And if we look at something, and I think people might know because of the Netflix thing, the whole uh, GameStop share as well, for instance, where they kind of said, don't hold the GameStop share um, on these general forex um, uh, or um, um, stock exchange, exchange guys like um, I don't want to mention names and I can't even remember, but like you know your everyday retail uh, uh, where you're buying stock, get um, um, get it transferred to a a, a, a comp computer share because they are the ones that provide all of these services to those retail guys, and that's actually better custody as well for you so the and then the the last way to do it is to actually take your own money um and go and do a deal with an investment i mean with a with a with a listed company like a um multi-millionaire whatever like christo visa has done you know he buys it himself that's almost like your total self-custody there's an in-between computer share and what i think uh, some businesses are doing and, and and the business that i'm involved in um doing uh, custody on behalf of clients. So not like an exchange, not where it's very retail, but um, custody on behalf of them in insecure wallets and things because that, there's a lot of people that don't have time to worry about these little things that they want to do. So I think there's a place in the market for everything and every type of investor. Um, went on a little bit long there on, on, on something I'm also a little bit passionate about, but that's, I think, the evolution of savings and things. And it, um, give your comment on that, what I've just said, if you've got any, and, and to, to, to move into discussions about things like personal savings and investments. Um, and what is your sort of personal philosophy on that for yourself, ultimately? Yeah, I think you, you touched on quite a lot of things here. You talked about mm. um, stocks and indexes. You spoke about where you um who you trust to mm. sort of as your broker to get mm. access to these things mm. um and then you touched on sort of i guess where the question is at what point do you sort of sort of start taking responsibility for your own mm. uh savings or, or, or mm. how much responsibility do you want to take exactly so i don't know if you want to <laughs> Do you mean? Do you mean what's my views on all these things, or specific things, or? Well, I mean, you it, want to focus on one I think thing. I, it was a lot, but I think I think to focus on I think 
using some of that to to potentially talk about your own sort of philosophy on that and what you and which you if it's your own philosophy you're probably applying it yourself just in terms of um just generally in terms of dealing with money as a as a concept um and maybe a little bit on how you see the the interplay between something like and i know we we just said that it especially bitcoin and things like that you know you want to move away from sometimes a little bit and and educate people on more payments so we're kind of talking i guess a little bit more about savings and investments here and 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 tying that in a little bit with with helping the listeners to 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 gain some value on what they should be doing with with them with their own money um well yeah i don't i don't think my personal philosophy should apply to anyone else really sure because i'm a bit mm -hmm. um as uh, like as an Somebody who likes to build things and um, understand how things work. Uh, I think that's that's a very small subset of the population. Most people would prefer to trust somebody else that's an expert to, to mm -hmm. manage their things, right? Most people. I I, I saw it yesterday um, on a, on a discussion forum. Somebody said, "All I do is I give my money to a um, a wealth advisor, and I mm -hmm. say to them." Um, pick medium risk uh, strategy and preserve my wealth. And then he just hands mm. it off to them and it's out of his mind. And for most people, that's probably the best, the best approach because if you're not an expert in something, uh, it's probably better to trust somebody else that is. Mm. Um, my personal philosophy is different from that. So, so I like to kind of uh, do first principle thinking, discover things from scratch, even if I make mm. mistakes. Um, my risk, my risk appetite is probably much higher than most people. And I've gotten burned so many times. Like I've, I have lost, <laughs> I've yeah, lost yeah. a lot of money. It does come, um, it does come. Maybe one of destroying yeah, things. Yeah. Comes with the territory. Um, maybe one of the stupidest things, like people are like, oh, you must have a ton of Bitcoin in the stash since you're like in the space so long. And then I tell them, no, that's not how it works. Uh, for you to kind of hold on to Bitcoin for a long time. That's actually the trick. It's not getting Bitcoin back in the day, it's holding on to it for a long time. And now you, like, you can probably pick up that, that I, my mindset is a bit different. I, I've never been a hodler, a good hodler. I've been mm. like, I get Bitcoin and then I'm like, ah, oh, cool. I can spend it on this new thing. Like, oh, Steam is accepting. There was a time where Steam was accepting Bitcoin. You know how, how much money I spent on Steam games? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, um, what's what would be the, the the price of those of the Bitcoin that I spend on those Steam games today? Like yeah. millions of rands. Yeah. Uh, I bought a motorcycle at some point um, with Bitcoin. Not a lot. Like it was a seventy thousand rand bike, a, a nice BMW. Today it would mm. be a four million rand motorcycle. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Just you know. But I mean, it's the same you, you for know, any not even being right, stupid. that you need to liquidate. Yeah to spend, to have yeah. immediate availability. So you've used it like money in many ways. I have, I have. so actually, mm. uh, so actually my stash is, is not that huge, but what, but what I have, I like to, um, I like to keep it myself. So like, I like to figure out how self custody works. Um, mm. bought, bought a hardware wallet. Um, you know, I've got sort of, you need to think about things like, what if you die? What if a bus eats you? And you're the only one that has the key. So I've got, so, yeah. so then you advance and you're like, oh, well, let's split it. So I've got um, uh, close people who I trust. And then I split the funds. And basically I can't even, like, I can't even spend my own money now because I have to, or I can't spend my savings because I have to get yeah. Two, yeah. Uh, two people together and then we'll do a little thing. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll combine our keys and then then I can spend it. Um, that's kind of for my savings, but then for my day to day spending, I like to also play with lightning and technology like that, mm. uh, and see if I can, you know, is that question, can you be your own bank? And mm. the, the answer used to be no, but today the answer is yes, you can. Yeah. So I like, to, I don't know. I just like to play with tech mm. and I like to sort of, um, build things. So I'm, my personal philosophy is very different, uh, yeah. to, to most people. 
and that's why I like to. That's why I like things like Bitcoin in particular because you can just get going. You download the source code, you install some software, and you're up and running. You don't have to yeah. wait for months and months and months to maybe get uh, yeah. like a merchant bank account or whatever. And you'll never ever get API access to your bank anyway. So yeah. So yeah, I guess it's very interesting for you sorry, because you can my, my personal my, yeah. Mm. yeah my personal philosophy is that like see see how far I can get you know um uh that's why I like things like solar generation see how far you can get generating your own electricity see how far you can get with the tech that's available today and sometimes the answer is mm. yeah, well you can't get all the way you need to use service providers mm. um, but it it I just like to play with this stuff mm. it's a matter of curiosity as well I guess and I think I mean, when I was just talking about personal finance and, 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 and advising people on, on that, going from sort of more product sales and specific product sales, which is largely the financial advice industry to more a coaching approach as well, because, and which is more also educational, because I do think that, yes, use an expert, but I think it's best to use an expert once you know where your shortcomings are. Rather than going, like you said, the guy, oh, I just give that guy my money and, you know, I think he'll do the best for me. And that's where a lot of people have also misunderstood. So I don't like to, and I, I found that the, the, the clients that you, that you, that you lose or, or don't want to work with, because there's also getting rid of a client is those that don't seem curious about learning for themselves. And I think generally, if you look at traditional financial services and now if we look at the new digital financial services, if we want to give it that word, is that there's holders of information and, and expertise, just like then who put themselves, who, who maybe at some point do have some expert knowledge and they hold that because that is what they're selling um, and they hold that information. But with, I think, the digital sort of era, the philosophy is a little bit more around um, sharing information and, and helping people understand. But you will still get people that are holding that information as value for their business. And I think that's where some of the issues come in and vested interests come into play and, and looking at, you know, what's, what's the reasoning for that and what's your gain. And it's not, there's no problem with with selling a service, but do it in the way that it, it, it is people realizing where their shortcomings are and you're an expert in the field, not just going, okay, you're an expert, you've put yourself out, so you just deal with everything. Because I think that's where people can have a downfall as well with regards to their personal finances mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. 100%. And people, yeah, it, it almost gets a bit predatory. I think in the sort of, the previous generation, like my parents' generation, they just went to Salam and Old Mutual. Not nothing mm. against Salam and Old Mutual, but that's they just went mm. to those entities and they sign up for policy and that's the end of their investment journey. And these yeah. or, or thinking about it. And these mm. days people are a lot more inquisitive. They mm. do a bit of research. Yeah. Which so I think is a great thing them. because I've definitely found that that adds more value to everyone because you do have like as people like yourself, maybe people like me have some knowledge and have some experience because you've, you've said you've tried many things, but it's about, it's about realizing where your shortcomings are so that you rather go and seek a specific expert for a specific area that you know is, is an area that you don't want to understand much more than you have already in your research, or you just don't have the time or the ability, but you'll, engage with them on a regular basis but you know don't work on your weaknesses work on your strengths type thing um yeah so that's very interesting i mean that's 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 i think how, how people should approach generally the sort of as you said first principles of savings and investments in any ways um carl we're getting sort of towards the end of the time that i have with you as well um you said your job is basically, in, like most of the people that I, I've spoken to, it grew out of a passion for you being able to, you know, um, inter interact with technology and your interest in that hardware and maybe 
and more software, you know, in terms of building things. Um, and you probably game a lot. You said you bought games with Bitcoin. Um, um, I used to. What, yeah. Yeah, you used to. Yeah. I never, I lost my childhood, so I never got into any kind of gaming. I actually got to, oh, yeah, I, have to start enjoying, yeah. <laughs> I have to start enjoying games again. I literally got to a point where I was the, really the, 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 um, what do you say it like the 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 person not wanting to play even a card game because of my my issues but uh, yeah it's in yeah um but understandable what do you do what do you do um to relax to take your mind off business and building things even though you love it i don't think my mind is ever off uh, <laughs> it never gets off yeah. um yeah. Yeah, man. The, yeah, that, that's the thing about if you're running your own project, it's extremely stressful because you. Mm. I mean, not only do you have to kind of figure out how you're going to be sustain yourself, you also have to make sure the other people that you're working with also are sustained. And you tend to put mm. them first. So, so if you're mm. putting yourself last, that's always going to be a source of a bit of personal tension and stress. And mm. I'm definitely going through a period of that at the moment. Like I'm trying to figure out where i go from here um mm. yeah, it's not so obvious and clear it's not like things are just magical and wonderful and, and you can just keep doing mm. what you love you have to at some point make hard decisions mm. um but for me to sort of just de-stress a bit uh you know i've i'm super fortunate to live in Stellenbosch. we've mm. got the most amazing um trails in the mountains here mm. and that's that's basically for me like to get out i get out into the field i go do a hike i go i love mountain mm. biking um i love sort of uh getting a little bit of an adrenaline rush by going as fast as i can down down a mountain that'll probably be my end like you'll you might read next week in the paper like carl eat his head on a on a tree stump going down a little too Hope fast not, but... um but at least you died yeah. doing something you love, <laughs> I, I guess. Yeah, so if you read that, you can uh, die yeah. doing something I love. But yeah, so that, yeah. that's it. Getting out to nature and hiking and, and cycling. Mm. That's, that works I was me. actually at, I actually went, you go, you obviously go to that, that place, I think it's Yonkazook, eh? that, that they've got a mountain bike trail and mm. a walk. And uh, I actually went yeah. there for yeah. the first yeah. time. That's, that's an awesome place to go. There you go. It's a fantastic place. Oh, there yeah. we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, definitely organize a hike with you someday because I don't think I've seen you for a while. Yeah, man. Yeah, people don't know this, but uh, Alma is also part of the uh, Money Badger story. We never even said the company's name, the company I'm working on. It's Money Badger. Mm -hmm. It used to be called Crypto yeah. Convert. Yeah. And uh, Alma was actually part of the sort of relatively the start of that thing. Mm. You've given us a whole bunch of legal advice and help with compliance and, and legal. Mm. I mean, you, you probably said you're not a compliance guy, but you've helped a lot with it. I've, I've started to uh, accept my, was my skill more, more and more. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's about how you approach it and, and, and how you deal with it. Because, I, you know, um, I've come a long way in understanding the regulatory space and, and understanding compliance, although I don't necessarily want to do it on a day to day basis. But, um, and yeah, we're both also going through a, a phase of getting our regulatory licenses um, at the moment. Mm. And that's an interesting thing that I don't think we want to necessarily talk about now. Let's get our licenses and maybe we can have another regulatory focused yeah. podcast on our experiences with regards to that. But yeah. Um, and we'll bore the people that don't want to, don't want to know about all yeah. the boring <laughs> regulatory we'll it, stuff. We'll, we might actually put it under a different uh, type of podcast where we talk a little bit more about these kind of things and go into much more depth into, into that. But um, yeah. So, okay. And um, you also, I mean, apart from that, you also do like sort of like um, trips and some, nature experiences and camping which i need to also again like gaming and games just generally get a little bit more into like um getting away and camping is that something that you enjoy yeah um like that 
bike that I mentioned, you, you and I know you've got a nice Africa Twin as well. I mean, mm. there's nothing that nothing that gets close to um, riding somewhere into the Karoo or the Kalahari, you know, somewhere where there's very few people and a lot of open space to just clear your mind. And then if you can find mm. a spot there to camp over and watch the stars, even better. Yeah, definitely. Something I still need to do. I mean, I did a sort of more road trip to Namibia last year, as you know. It was around the time that that my um, time with Money Badger was 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 ending in terms of what you needed at the time, and and to carry on. And I decided to also take a trip to Namibia, but definitely want to do something. But I've been waiting for my tires to really get finished so that I can get some some more fifty fifty tires or something like that, and and do a mm something that involves a bit more dirt road. I think that's a bit more fun. So do you still have your bike then? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. I had to sell you it. Probably sold, you probably sold it to fund your business, right? Yeah, to, <laughs> or your, yeah, for a bit, yeah. Of, a bit of extra runway. Yeah. To keep going. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, sadly, yeah. sadly, I don't have we'll, that we'll, one we'll anymore. Try organize, we'll, we'll try and organize some kind of rental and we'll still go on a bike ride. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I still got my kit, still got my gear. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's yeah. cool. I need to get some, gear, I think, some more, some more protective gear if we're going to do a little bit more off road. So like a, mm -hmm. But um, other than that, is there anything else that we forgot to mention that you might want people to know? So you can go to Pick and Pay. Um, you can download the crypto convert yeah. app. I'll put some details on um, <laughs> the description, description of the below. product. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, think I mean, maybe, I think it's... Yeah. Just to explain how it works. Yeah. So the the teller at Pick and Pay might not know about crypto or Bitcoin. So when you mm -hmm. go to them and you say, I want to pay with Bitcoin, please, they might be a little bit confused. The mechanism that we use is the QR checkout. So they've got three options, cash card and QR. A few, mm -hmm. few people know about QR, but it's there, it's available and they know about it. So you'll ask them for the QR payment option and then it displays a little code on that pin pad. Now you need a wallet that can read that QR code. Now there's a couple of that uh, wallets, like we mentioned, Luna and Valar. Their wallets understand that code. You can pay directly with their apps. You can you, they've got the functionality yeah. built into their apps. That's fine. Yeah. But then if you use other other wallets like Binance and Lightning wallets, they don't have that direct sort of ability. capability. Mm. And then what we've done is we've published a, um, a, like we call it a companion application. It's called Crypto QR. It's one word. If you just search for it in the Apple Play Store, you'll find it. If you just search Crypto QR, mm -hmm. no spaces, Crypto QR. Mm -hmm. uh, and th then you can link your other wallet that doesn't mm -hmm. understand the code directly. So once you've linked it, then you scan the code with the Crypto QR companion app and it launches the, the wallet. Yeah, very easy, so actually. Very easy. It's actually very yeah. easy. Uh, it's very lightweight. Yeah, you can choose your wallet on the back end. That's one of the only things that opens with the camera up so that it can do the QR code. Um, yeah. Yeah. Trying to think of anything else that I've experienced using it that people just need to be aware of. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just ask for the QR code right in the beginning because, I mean, naturally, these tellers are going straight to the bank card option and then they've got to like reverse mm. a little bit to go on the QR. So just say Even like, that's not too um, bad. Yeah. No, yeah. no, it's, it's, it's still, still quicker. Yeah. And I think before my, it's, it's often quick. before my transaction is complete on, on the app, the, the, the slips are already coming out and I'm not even sure. Yeah, like it's super it's fast. Through. Super fast, super fast. And mm. my first purchase with it, I do have an Instagram reel of it somewhere. Um, is mm. of two pizzas because of P Bitcoin Pizza Day. So that was pretty cool. Pizza Day. Yeah. Now I, yeah, I buy odds and ends sometimes, especially when I don't have my, my, my shopping budget has exceeded. Then I'll uh, buy a couple of things on that because um, I also don't have enough Bitcoin yet to, um, and one never has enough, I guess, <laughs> like you said, uh, to, to always pay with that. But yeah. Super easy, super super fast, and um, I usually go to other retailers now. Going, can I pay with Bitcoin? And they go, no, but so pick and pay can mm. take it. So good on them, <laughs> good on you guys. 
and uh, I'll put a lot of stuff in the description so people can also go straight to the page that maybe explains how they can do that and get to know you guys a little bit more. Cool. Thanks a lot, Omar. Cool, Good to man, see you again. Awesome. Good catch up. Was actually, it, this is the, the, the podcast where I think I've spoken the most, which is actually quite fun as well. But um, hopefully it was balanced. But good to chat, man. Do you ever get the Do you ever get the chance to talk about your history? I mean, that's that's quite oh, interesting. That's that's the, of, oh, I met you. I was at the. Yeah. It was at the at the uh, Anton memorial. Lubanowski, um memorial. Yeah. Yeah, we're busy planning. I'm I'm a little bit less involved these days, but. The, uh, we we're planning. It was maybe it was supposed to happen this year, but various reasons, and I think for for a good reason, we're hopefully going to have it in Namibia next year. So that'll be that'll be mm. good. It's, yeah, mm. to, this year is I think the fifth year. So it's been mm. it's been interesting. Yeah, that's our kind of. I met you before that, but that's when we got to know each other a little bit mm. a bit better. Yeah. yeah. Um. Awesome, but yeah, it's, it's a topic for another podcast, maybe a different topic type of podcast <laughs> yeah but awesome man nice to chat to you cool likewise cool, man. ciao ciao bye bye